I'm Jessica Pomondon with Royal Page Atlantic, and I am here with one of my dear friends, Lee Hansen of Barrel Hunter, who is one of our very own whiskey ambassadors for Canada. Welcome, Lee. Hey, Jessica. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is great. This is great. Thanks so much for joining us. I um, I don't know if I told you, but I've been doing a little bit of whiskey seminars out here in Fall River as well, and I think I had like 30 people at my last whiskey tasting. Awesome. I know. That was before COVID, so it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how you got involved in the whiskey business. How long have you been selling whiskey? I've been selling whiskey for 25 years. Um, I had uh, introduced, I was introduced to it by my grandfather. He uh, picked up a taste for, I wish I could say the good stuff, but he picked up a taste for scotch, period, uh, while he was uh, serving in, uh, in Europe during World War II. And it was just something that was always kind of around. And he introduced me to, uh, like I say, some not as good as uh, blended malt at far too young an age, uh, more to help me with a nap, say, than to educate me about whiskey. But it always kind of interested me uh, how there was all these different, uh, different bottles around the house with different ages and different, uh, different names on them. They were all scotch at the same time. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, that's great. So real quick, what is the difference between scotch and whiskey? Oh, well, that's a great question. So um, all scotches are whiskey, but not all whiskeys are scotch. Uh, to be uh, scotch whiskey, it has to be from Scotland. That's that's an obvious one. Uh, it has to be made with 100% barley. And it has to be aged for three years minimum in an oak barrel. That That's the definition of scotch. Uh, there's other types of scotch, there's single malt, there's blended, but all of those have to adhere to that. Um, American whiskeys, Japanese, Canadian whiskeys, they all have their different rules, but uh, scotch whiskey is, is that in a nutshell. Awesome. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your business um, as the Barrel Hunter. Can you describe your business for us? Yeah, so uh, I started Barrel Hunter uh, going back eight years ago now to work with uh, families uh, that make, uh, make wine and, and whiskey. And uh, I wanted to work on that family angle because I like working with people. And nothing to say uh, anything untoward about larger corporations and marketing directors and all that, but to be able to pick up the phone and talk to the guy that made it, or at the very least the guy whose grandfather made it before him, uh, and to be able to kind of bring those legacy products and uh, and share them with uh, with my friends here in Canada, it's uh, my prime motivation to get to get this family and things in front of people. That's awesome. So I guess that kind of also covers why you opened this business. Yeah, yeah. I um, I saw an opportunity. I've been working, as I said, with whiskey for twenty five years. I've worked for a couple of wholesaler distributors and I've worked in, in retail work production down in California years ago as well but uh, it came time for me to uh, to work for myself. Well that's the dream isn't it? Awesome. Uh, how did you get started in the whiskey business? Like how did you get started with the Barrel Hunter? Tell us how that began. Uh, I, had, I had some great advice. Um, I was getting started. I, I kind of come to the decision that I wanted to uh, start my own company and I wanted to import whiskey, uh, but I had no money. And uh, I, you know, I, I got a, a small uh, shared workspace and just started making cold calls. Um, I saw a, uh, uh, I just subscribed to a newsletter called The Drinks Business. And I saw that there have been changes with, uh, with one company where two brothers had split the company up and uh, I made a cold call. Uh, something all salesmen should be able to do. I, I picked up the phone, not knowing who was going to uh, answer on the other end. And I said, you know, sometimes there's changes. Um, when a company goes through changes, there's opportunities. And if you already have somebody here, that's fantastic. It's not my intention to steal anything from anybody. I want to create business, not, uh, not steal business. So if you have new opportunities, I hope you consider me. And uh, the, the family that I called, the Lang family, they called me back in, in 20 minutes. There's a, a seven hour time difference. And he must have had his phone, uh, you know, right there. It was nine o'clock at night, his time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just hit it off from there. He, he liked what I had to say about creating business instead of kind of moving it or taking it from somebody else. 
happens a lot in the in the uh, booze business where companies will jump and move with new distributors and whatnot. I just didn't want to be part of that problem. I wanted to create something new. Well, I and I can say from personal experience that working with you is really great. Your communication style, your friendliness, your professionalism, like I think everybody should have a boss like you. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. We had a lot of fun together. That's great. So what when you wake up on a on a cold, snowy morning, what motivates you? What drives you to get up and get the business done? Uh, paying bills, usually. Uh, <laughs> one of the things about uh, about being the importer is uh, that a lot of not a lot of people know, especially if you're owner operator, is uh, I have to buy the whiskey first. So when I import product, I own it and then I sell it just like a, a retail store has products for sale. Well, they own those products and they have to uh, put some margin in there and uh, and get those through. So when I'm buying hundreds and hundreds of bottles of, uh, of scotch, I got to need to make sure that those get to the uh, to the right houses. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I get and I guess how has COVID affected your business in the past year? Ah, there's been some ups and downs, as I'm sure everybody can say, I don't know, a lot of people would say mostly downs. I'm very fortunate. Um, I was able to um, still maintain uh, some great relationships. Um, something that I've heard, and I'm just honored by this, with, the, with a couple of clients is uh, because everything's harder now. Everything that used to take 10 minutes now takes 20. That um, a lot of my clients just simply trimmed up who they were working with, the importers, the suppliers that they wanted to work with. So I got really lucky. Uh, I've got some great relationships that go back a number of years. And I was- that, able to That's not luck. That's because you're great to work with. Yeah, that's nice. Um, but it, I, guess, I guess it isn't luck. Yeah, you're right about that. It's something that I've fomented. Um, it's, uh, it's always been uh, about a longer game for me. Uh, when it comes to working with clients, I've always said, this is how it is. If there's something difficult to discuss, we're going to discuss it right now. If we don't, it's going to just get bigger and uh, less manageable. I'd rather be uh, giving somebody uh, a bad news phone call than, uh, than receiving a really bad news phone call because I haven't shared any information. And I think people respect that, that honesty. Um, Another thing that changed is, you know, not being able to get in front of people. Uh, so something I like to do, I like to put whiskey in people's hands and talk about where it came from. And uh, that was difficult, but I was able to do a bit of a pivot. And uh, like a lot of people started using Zoom to uh, I would literally be doing these uh, uh, almost drug deals where I'd, uh, I'd show up with a little bag and, uh, <laughs> and leave it on the doorstep and then go home. And, uh, and then we'd fire up a Zoom call and talk about what was in front of them. So again, that's another thing that takes longer, uh, but uh, still very rewarding to, uh, to be able to do that and utilizing the technology. I like how it all kind of sucked before. The, uh, the teleconferencing, the video conferencing apps just weren't that good. And all of a sudden, boom, the world needs it it got better. Big surprise. Yeah, that's not the truth. Awesome. So let me, let me ask you, what has surprised you about owning, about starting your own business? Because you worked in the business, you worked in the liquor industry for a very long time. And when you went out on your own, what were, were there any big surprises? You know, uh, it shouldn't have been a surprise, but it still was. I've worked for a few companies when, um, when it came time to uh, submitting expenses or uh, reporting how uh, how successful your, your your week was or you know just sort of tracking everything and what I heard from a number of bosses is well the accountant wants us to do it this way well the accountant wants this instead oh no we need to report this differently the accountant said and I remember saying to I think our boss uh, at one point when we worked together like I don't work for the effing accountant. <laughs> That's the, I'm done. Forget it. I, I can't jump through all these hoops. Turns out I can jump through the hoops because uh, it turns out you do work for the accountant, no matter what. It might be your name on the door, but at the end of the day, the accountant is the one that's going to kind of keep your business running and straight. So that's that's what I learned. Listen to your accountant and um, you know try to be 
ahead of the game. I never am, but uh, I try. Uh, and uh, that, that was the biggest thing. It's like, well, all those bosses I had for years were absolutely right. It is, uh, it is very, very important that we do what the accountant said. You're, you're wise, Manly, and you, you're, you're always open to learning, which is great. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> cool. So can you tell me something that people don't know about the whiskey industry? I pay a lot of taxes, like, like a lot, a lot of taxes. There, um, there's excise taxes, uh, environmental levies that you have to pay to ship it. You know, it, it ships in a box. It's decidedly unsexy. Uh, at times, it's all spreadsheets. And, uh, it, you know, I wish it was bagpipes and kilts and, uh, you know, Slangeva and all of that. But uh, there, there is a lot of... Uh, a lot of money going back and forth that never sees uh, never sees my my bank account. Um, certainly, it uh, it is it would shock you the price difference between point A and point let's call when you buy it at a retail store point D. Uh, all the different layers of expenses that get added to it. It, and in some places in the world, uh, it's much worse. Alberta is an amazing place to, uh, Canada period is an amazing place to import whiskey. Um, there are some places where there are zero uh, sin taxes. So I, I imagine that might be easier, but um, yeah, it is, it is just shocking how much, how many layers get added to these uh, wonderful products before they get to our homes. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, can you tell me uh, or share a memorable experience with a customer or a client? <laughs> I, um, I've been working with whiskey for a while um, and uh, I was decidedly niche. There is one thing to work with, you know, one supplier and you sell their 10 year old all the time and every week you look at your numbers and you get your distribution, but there's some fun uh, more intimate projects. And one of them that I worked with uh, years ago was the first full barrel of whiskey that I sold. And uh, I got involved with this group of, uh, of buyers and they were wild varied in their profession. Some of them were big oil people. Uh, there was a number of teachers in this group. They all just loved whiskey and wanted to have their own barrel with their own, their own club name on it. So um, I went to a dinner party with, uh, with this group there was 12 of them there and we we had the samples we had 200 milliliter bottles we had five of them and it was just such a great thing to say which one of these are we going to buy wow. which one of these sorry which one of these are you going to buy from me mm -hmm. so there was no we might buy it was which one of these are we going to buy so it was amazing and everybody was super excited to uh to get in on it um, and then once we had decided and keep in mind, I said there was about 12 people I only had 200 milliliters of each. So it wasn't, you know, a bacchanalia. We weren't getting you know, drunk or even, even tipsy really. Uh, but, um, wine did come out after we had decided we were having this kind of this fun dinner and lamb was on the table and the hostess leaned over to, uh, top up somebody's wine and she lit her hair on fire. <laughs> There was, a, there was a candle on the table and everyone was ah! No candles on the tables ever again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Uh, you guys have a good time and I'll get the, uh, the order ready for you. That's oh, the same group. Of you've never seen a happier group of guys unloading a truck. Right. <laughs> Big smiles on their faces, moving these boxes of whiskey out. Mm -hmm. It was just an amazing, amazing experience. Cool. I just want to back up a, a second. So Barrel Hunter, maybe you could explain a little bit about what that means. Like, what are you hunting? Ah, yes. Uh, I, would, I, I put a, a fun kind of, this is me on my Instagram. And it was like, always looking for that elusive uh, dram that's really, really hard to get or the kind of thing you have to know a guy uh, to do. There's lots of opportunities when it comes to uh, wine and whiskey, there, there are plenty of products out there. And a lot of us kind of get exposed to um, whatever product can afford an article or uh, an advertisement in the magazines that we read or the media that we consume. Uh, but there are so many small family owned or, or the single barrel stuff that, uh, that I was talking about earlier. That's the, that's the joy, sharing that stuff. 
Um, are you trying? Are you saying that there are barrels of whiskey lying around Scotland that are just waiting to be found? How does that happen? So there's uh, there's private collectors that uh, just just like this this group um, that I uh, that I was talking about that dinner party. Uh, there are people in Scotland specifically, and in the U.S. and in Japan and anywhere they make whiskey, that will give distilleries a little bit of walking around money. They're going to buy a barrel when it's three or five years old uh, for a discounted price, and then they age it themselves. Um, so there's private collectors that you can buy those from. There are intermediary companies that that's what they do. They buy barrels and store them and bottle them when they're ready. Um, and so, you know, getting connected with, uh, with uh, I mentioned the Lang family earlier. I've worked with uh, Murray McDavid before as well. Uh, so that it is a, a, like, um, it's not a secret industry, but it's not the one that gets all the notice because they're not advertising. They, they don't have to. They've got 500 bottles to sell, not 5 million. Interesting, interesting. So what advice would you give to somebody who is looking for a very rare special bottling? I mean, Nova Scotia, where it's uh, we have a monopoly here, so we have the the board goes out and purchases. What would you advise uh, a local, like a Nova Scotian buyer, if they really wanted to get their hands on something rare and really special? Where would they start? Well, you know, you know, I would I would definitely start with what was uh, closest at hand. Um, I would hate to take anything out of the pocket of a retailer in Nova Scotia, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are small, it's almost like a lottery. Uh, the companies that have access to most of the products will always put their finest products with their finest clients, but they still have a distribution model to, uh, to uphold. So often there are great opportunities, even in small markets, but you have to get in first. So I would have a strong relationship with my, my local and, uh, and see and make that, you know, ask that question first. Uh, and then secondly, there are, uh, there are trade magazines um, or, uh, you know, your whiskey advocate, that kind of thing. And by having a close relationship with, uh, with your local, you could have the opportunity to start that discussion. Hey, can you get this? I'm not sure. I'll talk to the importer. And that's a, a great process. Otherwise, there are, um, Canada has kind of cracked open the door to um, allowing liquor to flow a little more freely across the provincial borders. So there are, I mean, you can put the stuff in Canada Post now and, uh, and send it. So if you can't get it local, start looking at, uh, at other markets, specifically within Canada, that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, otherwise, if you're looking at outside of Canada, you got to get on a plane <laughs> and you, you got you to go to Scotland. You got to go to New York. You have to bring this stuff back and, uh, and pay the duties because it's just not going to get shipped here from other country. Gotcha. Cool. Um, and did I already ask you, how does one become a whiskey ambassador? Uh, no, you didn't ask me that. Um, it's, as, it's as romantic as, uh, as you can imagine. I get to, uh, I had to drink a lot of whiskey and build up a, a strong knowledge base, but um, there's a lot of the back end stuff too, like, you know, making those hard phone calls uh, so that you are uh, respected and, uh, and have a standing within the community so that when the time comes, when these do job, when these jobs do open up, uh, when you get to be a whiskey ambassador, it's because you've put in the, uh, the hard yards uh, and the entrepreneurial yards to say, I'm, I'm willing to stand in front of your product and represent it well. That's fantastic. Um, so is there anything exciting coming down the pipeline you'd like everyone to know about? Um, the little pivot that I've done, um, I mentioned earlier with uh, dropping off a bag at, at someone's house and then going through, that was that started with uh, whiskey buyers for uh, for my clients for the retail and, uh, and when they were allowed to be open restaurants. Um, I've been able to expand that a bit and now I'm doing uh, tastings for clubs uh, across Canada, where I'm using Canada Post, all very legal, and shipping uh, small, you know, one ounce bottles of uh, of the whiskey, and then hosting a tasting online. It's been really, really well received. People have been looking for things to do. You can only binge watch so much, and uh, and often there are several people on these Zoom tastings that all know each other, 
And so it's a great way for these people to connect over a shared passion without risking their loved ones uh, or their own personal health. So it's been, it's been amazing. People are allowing themselves to enjoy the finer things in life, but not having to worry about parking or driving or um, overindulging in any way. They're at home, they're safe. Yeah. Yeah. That's been kind of fun. Well, that's really awesome, Lee. It's been so great catching up with you. Thank you for sharing everything about the Barrel Hunter and Hunter Lang. I look forward to when we can actually have some whiskey together. Oh my God, I miss it. I miss you and, uh, and I, I definitely miss connecting over, over a glass, that's for sure. Awesome, well, let's do it again real soon. Talk soon, bye-bye.